Hello and welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us again today for another Hasselblad webinar. I'm Mark Whitney, part of Hasselblad's global marketing team, and I'm joined today by my colleague Chris Coos, who is Hasselblad's global technical communications manager. Uh, today's webinar is an next system Q&A session where you, the audience, have suggested topics for us to discuss in relation to the X1D, the X1D2 and the 907X cameras. So just before we go on and meet Chris, got a few slides to go through. Um, so as always, today's webinar is being recorded and uh, the recording will be posted to Hasselblad's YouTube channel within a few hours of the webinar or worst case by tomorrow morning. Um, if you've missed any of our previous webinars, they're also on the, the Hasselblad YouTube channel. Uh, so feel free to have a look back through them if you've missed any. I also want to just advertise that the public voting for the Hasselblad Masters 2021, uh, the finalists are now online on our website. So if you haven't already voted, uh, please go to our website and vote before the end of the month, the 31st of October. So today's agenda, um, we did get a lot of questions regarding future products, uh, but just to let everyone know, we aren't able to answer those in today's webinar. Uh, it's not the right place for it. Uh, also, you know, we're not able to share any information on products that haven't yet been announced. Uh, suffice to say, Hasselblad is always developing new products that incorporate the latest technology. Uh, to meet the need and benefit of our customers so we can assure you that we are constantly researching and investigating new opportunities. Uh, the only thing we can suggest is that you subscribe to our newsletters in order to be kept up to date on any new product announcements. So with regards to the um, topics that we are covering, uh, this is what we've come up with. So using the HTS 1.5 with the X system cameras. So the HTS is the tilt shift adapter for the H system cameras, but there is a way that you can use it with the X system cameras. So we'll be going through some of the benefits of using the tilt shift adapter, why you would want to use it, and then the options for using the adapter on the X1D, the X1D2 and the 907X. Now the next topic will be auto ISO. So how does the auto ISO option work? In which mode is it available? And then how to configure that uh, with your for your personal preference with the settings that are available. The next topic will be using the CFV 250C with V-System bodies. So the CFB 250C is the digital back part of the 907X. And we had a few questions about how to use that with various v, uh, fee system bodies. So Chris will cover that, which bodies it's compatible with and how to set it up and use it. The next subject will be electronic viewfinder settings. Again, a few questions on how to set the viewfinder to be viewfinder only with no rear screen and vice versa. So we'll go through that. And then finally, the 907X control dial. So this is a dial that is uh, around the outside of the shutter button. And um, just to clarify how that works and what sit, uh, settings it controls. So again, the approximate running time is about 50 minutes. And that will leave us some time at the end, hopefully, for some questions that you can submit using the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, just to note that the questions should be in relation to today's uh, topics. Um, so that we can uh, keep it on topic and any other questions or queries you have, um, hopefully save them for an, a future Q&A webinar. So just to go through um, the next webinars. So the next webinar Hasselblad hosting is an interview with Ben Thomas. Ben Thomas is one of our Hasselblad Masters winners in 2018 for the street and urban category. Um, ben will be coming to us live from Melbourne. Uh, so it's a little bit of an earlier time, I'm afraid, uh, to suit Ben's uh, time zone. Um, so 12 o'clock Greenwich Mean Time or 1 o'clock European Time. That's on the 11th of November. And then the next Q&A webinar will be back to the Focus Q&A webinar, which we've got scheduled for the 24th of November at the usual times. So, Chris, how are you? Hi, Mark. Yeah, I'm fine. Thank you. Great. Let me just uh, throw over the controls to you. Excellent. There we go. Okay, hopefully you can see the screen. So hi everyone. We will start off as Mark said with the HTS uh, with X system cameras. Now probably most people are used to seeing a, a HTS attached to a, a H system camera. Um, that's primarily what the unit was designed for, uh, but with a, a couple of extras, we can use that particular unit. So if we just remove the camera and add the 
X1D2 in this case. And then we have, in this case, the XH converter. Now, before we move on to look at the detail side of it, I just need to say the HTS, probably a lot of you already know, but in terms of recommended H system lenses that we uh, say to use, effectively they're the 24, the 28, and then the 35, the 50, 80, and the 100. Now, they're the ones that are manageable, shall we say, when attached to the HTS. You could physically attach the 150 and the 210, but because they are longer, heavier lenses, uh, they're a little bit, uh, should we say, lopsided in terms of the weight, uh, more difficult to control and make adjusting the, the tilt and shift mechanism a little bit harder. Uh, so we suggest the 24 to the 100 are the best lenses to actually use uh, in conjunction with the HTS. In terms of options, because effectively we're trying to make up the difference with the X camera for what would be the H body between the HTS and the camera, uh, digital back, we have the XH adapter and the XH converter. As you probably know, the XH adapter is effectively a, a, just a clear tube, and that allows us to attach the uh, HTS directly to the X body, uh, but we don't get uh, any of the advantages of the converter point eight. So effectively, there's a slight crop factor when we use the standard XH adapter. So your focal length would be slightly increased in the same way as would happen if you were using a, a H60 50C uh, compared to, you know, the sensor basically is physically smaller than the 53 by 40 mil 100 megapixel. So that's why you get that slight crop factor. So the XH converter point eight, as we've said in previous webinars, uh, enables us to keep the field of view from the H lens uh, and also remove that additional crop factor. That means we can keep that wide angle view compared to the standard adapter. Now, I've got a table here which will just clarify that a little bit. So if I was to use the 24 mil HCD lens with the HTS, which has a 1.5 times magnification, the XH converter would allow me to have a slightly longer focal length, only slightly. So 29 mil instead of the 24. But with the standard XH adapter, we would get quite a lot of additional focal length. So we'd be up at 44 mil. Now that may actually work in your favor if you want a slightly longer focal length, so you could choose that particular adapter. So again, it's a choice there. What do you want in terms of field of view? Do you want to keep the wide angle or are you quite happy with the little bit of extension on the focal length? In terms of functionality, uh, if you've never used the 1.5, HTS 1.5 before, effectively we have uh, an 18 mil plus or minus of shift where we can move the lens up or down. We have a tilt mechanism that gives us uh, plus or minus 10 degrees. And we have a rotation capability of plus or minus 90 degrees. Now those movements can be combined Obviously, if we are using rotation plus tilt and shift at the same time, you have to effectively limit one of those movements because of the way that we're, we're mixing and matching all of the actual movements. So these particular uh, maximums are purely single axis or single tilt mechanism only. So that's the maximum you could possibly get. When you use them in combination, there's a little chart there that just explains what you can get. So moving on, what do what these functions actually give us? What's the point? So we're going to start with the, the tilt option. By default, when you've got the, the H lens mounted onto your HTS and your camera body, the, the two lines here show your default amount of depth of field. So if we look at this particular test image, we can see that the depth of field, the sharpest part is roughly just in front of this end figure, and it's just starting to fall off around the rear figure. Now that's a classic uh, depth of field setting there. So we have the front and the rear. 
if I now use the tilt mechanism on the HTS 1.5, if I tilt towards the wall in this case, what I can do is move the uh, depth of field from the lens, as it were, along the wall. So I physically uh, increase the depth of field at this case. So you can see here we've increased the sharpness at the front end here, and we've uh, increased the depth of field here at the back of the of the actual sculpture on the wall. We can also go the other way. So if we tilt to the left in this case, we actually reduce the depth of field or apparent depth of field that we can see. So here we can see the back end of the depth of field, and here at the beginning figure we can see the depth of field just starting to kick in there. So that can be used very creatively. You can control where the depth of field sits in your image. And obviously, in this case, we've used it in a, in a, a landscape format, but we can do exactly the same, uh, enabling if I was shooting a, a portrait style, let's say landscape image, I could tilt the depth of field to increase uh, the foreground sharpness, apparent sharpness, and then not worry about maybe the sky. So that covers the, the tilt. Shift movement. So by default, uh, just a very basic graphic here. If this is the uh, sensor, so we have the magenta rectangle here is the sensor area. The normal uh, image circle created by the lens, we have a, a small amount of extra to make sure that obviously the co uh, corners are, are well illuminated, but the image circle is generally quite tight. In this case, the tripod, or shall we say the camera is looking straight ahead and normally we'd have to tilt the, the uh, camera here to get the top of the tree. So in this case, we then add on the HTS. And the first thing that happens is with the uh, glass element within the HTS, we get a bigger image circle. So as you can see here, if we then use the shift mechanism and we shift the lens up, the image circle moves up and basically the sensor stays in the same position, but as the image circle moves up, I can still keep my camera uh, parallel to the ground, don't have to tilt it back, but I can still now get the whole of the tree in. So if we look at a real life uh, image here. So this is the building we want to capture. Very basic setup. So X1D, converter, HTS and a tripod, standard sort of setup. And when we set the camera uh, level onto the tripod, looking straight ahead, we can't get the top of the building in. Classic way would be to tilt the camera backwards so that we can get the top of the building. And obviously that then introduces, unfortunately, converging verticals, not quite what we we're after. If, however, we use the, the shift movement on the HTS, just shift the lens up, that enables us to get the top of the building because of the increased image circle. I can move that up. Um, obviously, we do then um, slightly reduce the uh, foreground area because we're shifting that image circle up. You can also use that for stitching. So in this case, I've rotated the HCS 90 degrees, and now we're shifting, in this case, to the left. Take an image, we can center it, take an image and so on. And then because we've kept the camera body in exactly the same place, we've not uh, rotated the camera to get the left and right, right image, it becomes really, really easy to then stitch those together in uh, Photoshop or your choice of editing app to get a very quick and easy stitch. So there are a few limitations. The accessory itself obviously is designed to be used uh, with a H-System camera body. Because of that, when we connect everything up through the XH adapter or the 0.8 converter, the information that would have been captured 
if we were connected to a H system body, which is such as the rotation angle, the tilt and the shift information, none of that information is available to view on the uh, X system body in the displays. I mean, obviously you can read it from the scales on the HTS itself, but in terms of electronic display, there's no information there. Additionally, no information will be encoded in the EXIF data of the, uh, each capture that you make. Uh, that was something that you, again, had from a H-System camera. Basically, all of that rotation, uh, shift and tilt information was embedded into the EXIF data. AF, the limitation here is not the HTS. It's basically the uh, firmware version of the H-System lens that you're using. If it's uh, one of the newer lenses with the version 18 or higher uh, firmware, then obviously it will still autofocus even with the HTS. If it's an older lens with a uh, version 17 or lower, unfortunately the, the AF won't, won't be usable and you'll have to manual focus. The final point, there are no automatic lens corrections. So within focus, you will then have to manually go into the lens corrections and select uh, information there. Okay. When you uh, bring all these parts together, so the, the H lens, the HTS, the converter and the camera body, it's quite a long assembly and depending on which lens you're using, quite a heavy assembly. So to try and uh, support that as best you can, rather than hanging everything off of the uh, camera tripod socket. An alternative is to use the tripod support ring, which is available as an accessory. That will fit around the XH converter or the XH adapter quite happily connect around that. The, the one thing that I would say though, when you attach this, attach it the other way around, so back to front. So normally we would have it gripping here and the foot facing forward. If you have the foot facing forward, it can limit the rotation and uh, shift mechanism of the HT HTS if you're trying to shift downwards. So in that case, if you attach the tripod ring with the foot facing backwards, it'll make your life so much easier. Okay. I think we've covered any questions on the HTS mark while we're before we move on. Um, no, no, no Good. questions on that one. Point, so, yep, move on. Cool. Uh, so, we're moving on to uh, the CFE 250C and compatibility. We'll start with the, the basic list. So, with the current CFE 250C, there is pretty much no need for. Uh, cable op cabled operation with any of these cameras here. Uh, there's a couple of additions which we'll go through depending on whether you're trying to do remote control and so on, but we'll talk about that in a moment. So effectively by connecting the digital back to any of these cameras, so your 500 series, your uh, modified SWC and the 903 and 905, uh, modified or unmodified uh, 200 series cameras, plus obviously 2000 series, and then your, your motorized, your 555s, et cetera. All of those cameras effectively mount the back onto the camera, and that's it. Exposure control, we'll talk about in a moment in terms of how it's achieved, uh, but as long as you select the correct uh, camera type in the camera menu, you should have no issues at all with literally just mounting the digital back onto the camera body. In terms of the camera body selection, uh, once you disconnect the 907X, if you power up the digital back, uh, once it's on the V camera, you can power it up beforehand if you wish to, the camera body option appears. Up until that point, it's not available with the 907 connected, uh, so you have to remove that and it will appear. Once you select camera body, you've then got 500 as a default that's in there. Once you hit that, you then get a pull down list and basically your options will be starting with the 500, then the 500 with the winder, the 200 modified, standard uh, unmodified 200, 2000 series, 
SWC ELX and then the two final ones uh, for uh, third party type devices and then uh, obviously electronic shutter which we'll talk about in some depth in a moment. I spoke about cable free operation just a moment ago and the only one really that you're going to need a cable would be if you were using the winder. Um, especially if you were going to do camera remote control, uh, you need the cable going into the into the digital back. Also with the ELX and ELDs, again, if you want, uh, should we say camera remote control, you need to, through focus I'm talking about here, then there is a specific cable slot on the digital back, which we'll look at in a moment for the uh, ELX as well. Once you select your camera body, uh, when you return to the control screen, this is pretty much what you're presented with. So ISO and white balance are your pretty much your two controls. Exposure control is uh, carried out in the following way. So as I say, the digital back by default White balance ISO, you can set those. Your shutter speed, obviously controlled by either the uh, shutter in your V lens, or if you have a, a camera body with a focal plane shutter, obviously you, you're setting on the camera body, the actual shutter speed. Aperture as well, obviously is set on the lens. Once you've done that, the exposure time for the digital back, in this case, is controlled by this exposure pin, which uh, physically presses against this sensor here. The point about that is, if you have, a, a, shall we say longer, so I'm talking about more than half a second exposure time that you're trying to use with the camera, it's very important that you, you don't stab at the shutter and you don't do quick press and let go. You must press the shutter for the relevant amount of time until the exposure is finished because that controls the exposure time on the digital back. If you do a quick stab, effectively the digital back will do a very quick exposure, which could be far quicker than your uh, shutter speed that you've set on the lens. For most, uh, typical shooting speeds, you know, 500th, 250th, you shouldn't ha in encounter any real issues in terms of quick presses, but just for the longer shutter speeds, you know, especially if you're using a cable release, press and hold until the exposure is finished on the lens. Okay. Flash triggering. We, we get a lot of questions about flash triggering uh, with this digital back. Now, by default, obviously there's no hot shoe on the digital back. Uh, that's not ma a major problem. You have the flash uh, in and flash out, which we'll go through now. So flash out, I can connect my trigger. I can collect uh, a physical flash unit directly into the flash out through the three and a half mil jack. And when I take an image, when the digital back is triggered, it will then send a pulse and trigger either uh, the, the flash unit itself or obviously uh, enable the flash trigger to send a signal. For those that really want some kind of holder for their uh, trigger, if you've got the OVF, obviously you can use the cold shoe in there to support it or a small piece of Velcro to attach to the tripod uh, leg or something like that. Or obviously there are a couple of third party uh, metal L-frame manufacturers out there now that have got uh, compatible units. Okay, so that's flash triggering. Exposure triggering for, let's say, non-V system cameras. So one example of that would be the arc body or, you know, a technical camera, something like, a, you know, an Alpo, a Linhof, in this case, with a, a mechanical shutter, so let's say a, a standard copal shutter. Here is very, very simple in terms of the uh, exposure triggering. In this case, we have a cable from the lens, and, uh, the actual flash 
sync socket and that will then come to the digital back and we have a connection for the plug uh, flash in socket so in this case it's a two and a half mil jack and that's basically all you need there plus in terms of the camera settings you need to set um, the any stroke flash sync option for the camera body and that will then enable you to uh, have easy triggering from your copal shutter and trigger the digital back correctly. Just to sort of reiterate, it's, it's quite important to select the correct camera body. If you imagine if I have a, an SWC or a 903 or a 905 SWC, the time from when the, uh, the shutter button is pressed on those cameras to when uh, the shutter, shutter physically takes the image is very quick because obviously SWC, no mirror, nothing to move. It's just literally triggering the lens shutter. So the timing there is very quick. If I have, uh, a, let's say, uh, you know, a 500 series camera, when I press the shutter, there's a, a slightly longer delay in terms of we need to lift the mirror out the way. We need to open the secondary shutter and then fire the lens shutter. So there's a, a time, additional piece of time there that we need to wait before we trigger the digital back. So that's why it's important that you actually select the correct camera within that menu to enable those delays in terms of triggering the exposure to be taken into account. A final one, uh, in this case, the electronic shutter mode. So when you select this, that then opens up a, a shutter speed option on the digital back. Now that then gives you the, your, your classic range of shutter speeds from 68 minutes all the way through to uh, one ten thousandth of a second. So big range of, of exposure times there. Obviously, in this case, with electronic shutter, you would then be using, if it was a V-system lens, you would lock everything open in terms of the, the shutter. Same here with the copal shutter and your technical camera. Effectively, you're just having the digital back act as your shutter. Aperture control, of course, is still uh, on the lens here at the front. The one downside, obviously, of that uh, electronic shutter is uh, no flash compatibility. Uh, the way that the system works in terms of reading out the sensor means that uh, it's very difficult to, to enable it to, to work with a flash exposure. In this case, uh, you, you probably know that the, the sensor that's in this digital back, it takes 0.3 of a second to read out, so 300 milliseconds basically to read out from top to bottom. And obviously, if there's movement within uh, your image you're trying to capture, then you'll get the, the, the rolling shutter type situation. So you just need to be aware, but it does give you opportunities to use other lenses where you've not got control of the shutter. Okay. Any questions on that one, Mark? Um, yes, uh, we've got a few on that. Um, okay. Look. Um, I can go back so if I need to. Yeah, a question from Stefan. Um, he uses um, B and T settings um, on his 500 ELX. Does that require yep. a cable? Uh, for the B setting, as long as you've switched it on on uh, on on your camera, basically, you. I would say use a cable release is probably the best way for 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 T. You physically uh, start the exposure and lock it open by, you know, locking the the, the cable release on, or keep the pressure on the uh, the button on the front of the camera, and then once you've re uh, hit your desired exposure time, then release it. So basically, you're keeping pressure on that uh, should we say exposure sensor that's in the digital back by keeping the shutter button pressed in on the camera. You keep the pin engaged. And that way you can then very easily control your T exposure as long as you like. Uh, the, the B setting, again, that should then lock in. You can actually lock the shutter on the camera body for that if you wanted, you wouldn't need a cable release. And again, once it's locked, 
it'll it'll go on for as long as you like and then you can release it so personally i would say i would use a cable release attached to the camera shutter to enable me to get the b and t settings that i want okay and then the same sort of question for the 503 cw from michael again the same thing basically you shouldn't need a cable per uh, per se for just general shooting uh, if you, you're using uh, the winder, the bolt-on winder, the cable connection there is purely if you want to remote the remote control the camera from um, from focus. If I was doing remote capture that way, if you just want to to trigger the camera normally, uh, no, you don't need a cable. Okay, um, that's it for now. There's a few more questions coming in, so I'll continue to review and um, maybe we can go back to that later. Uh, yeah, yeah, like, well, I'm, I'm having a bit of trouble with my webcam, so I haven't appeared for some reason, but I'll try and sort that. So, <laughs> yeah. okay. Thank you, Chris. Okay, uh, right, let's go then. So I'm going to move on to Auto ISO. Just a, a couple of bits and pieces really to, to work through on this. So uh, Auto ISO, Effectively, the camera supports auto ISO in full auto, program mode, and the auto modes effectively, so shutter and aperture priority. But currently, it's not available in manual um, or either of the manual modes, or manual quick, I should say. Um, it has been requested many times, I'll be honest. It's been pushed through to R&D to see if it's possible to add, but currently, it's only available in the auto modes. In terms of uh, settings, what it's used for, there's a couple of bits and pieces that you need to set, but the main one really would be the uh, minimum ISO, uh, sorry, minimum shutter speed in, before it then moves on. Um, so we need to then configure these bits and pieces, but auto ISO generally is, uh, let's move on, sorry, get the slide to come up. Now my system's playing up. Yeah, so the configuration. So first off, we need to set within the custom, uh, sorry, camera settings and configuration option, we can set the minimum and maximum ISO that we want the uh, auto ISO to move through. You also need to set how your uh, minimum shutter speed is gonna be calculated. And you have a couple of options. You can set a physical speed. So again, from around um, one second upwards, or you can set um, a partial amount of the focal length. So in this case, the camera was showing two F, so that would be one over two times the focal length. So if I had my 45 mil lens attached, in this case, the camera would alter the, uh, ISO if my shutter speed went lower than 1 90th of a second. And you have options there from uh, four times the focal length to half the focal length, depending on how you, how well you feel you can support the camera and, and the combination. Firstly, I would say the function of the focal length is probably slightly easier if you're going to use the auto ISO, because then if you put a longer lens on, it then ups the speed. If you put a wider lens on, it knows you can support that theoretically um, to a slower speed with the wide angle lens, so then it will automatically allow a slightly lower speed. So those are the two um, important things you need to set. Shutter speed calculation, and then your ISO limits. Now within that, when the auto ISO is actually functioning, there, are a couple of different ways that the system can move. Now, as an example, if I'm um, shooting, let's say, in aperture priority mode, and I've set my uh, aperture and I'm stopped down quite a way, as the speed drops, if I'm in a low light situation, my shutter speed comes down to my limit and the ISO will start to move. If I reach the maximum ISO, the system has no option to either move the shutter speed or 
adjust the aperture depending on which way it can go. So the system will then start to change the physical settings in terms of the shutter and the uh, aperture, if unless we're at maximum, to actually maintain a correct exposure. So the system will override your limits when you reach the extremes. Okay. Okay. And the same would, would happen if I was in uh, program mode. Generally with program mode, you, you then get a, uh, a set aperture and shutter combination for your light level. And as you know, I can use the uh, control wheel to then modify those combinations. So I could uh, use the front control wheel on an X1D uh, or X1D2 to then you know, get a faster or slower shutter speed or wider or stop down aperture. And again, when that combination reaches a certain point, the ISO will obviously move. If I then try to adjust that combination, at that point, the system has to jump in and say, sorry, no, I need to change the aperture to keep a, and maintain a correct exposure. It can't just do it via so. So these are generally in the extremes when you're either very, very bright or very, very dark, low light situation, but you, the auto ISO is, is not, you know, it won't cover everything when you reach the extremes. That's especially true if you set a small range on your auto ISO. So yeah, maybe I set only 800 or maybe even 1600 here, depending on how and where I'm shooting, it could be very quick to, to hit those limits. Okay. So a couple of questions came in about uh, controlling the displays. And so in terms of EVF only, this one's very simple. We can go to uh, general settings, live view, and we can tick the EVF only button. Now this is purely for live view. Your rear display would still be available for your control screen functions and settings and so on. But in terms of live view for shooting, it will then switch off that capability on the rear display. It's EVF only. And if you're gonna shoot like that, the second option really is you tick the always start live view, as soon as your eye goes to the EVF and triggers the, the, the sensor, live view will start. You won't need to press the, the shutter, half press that to actually make it work. So that's a simple way of keeping the camera in EVF only mode. So conversely, um, you're looking at the other way, which is uh, the rear display only. Now, probably thinking, well, why, why would you want that? Well, imagine we're going to put the camera into a, a, a container or into a, a tight fitting area. We're never going to use the EVF, but there is a possibility of something in that packaging moving and triggering the uh, EVF sensor. We want to stop that. And so very straightforward we go into the uh, eye sensor settings and set the sensitivity to off. Now, whatever you do, uh, put your finger over the sensor, etc. it will not, uh, EVF will not work basically. So you'll be limited to live view if you want it on the rear display. Uh, obviously the control screen functions will still be there, but imagine if this was in a particular uh, a housing, um, underwater housing in this case, let's say, the Aquatech one, you, you could then set the sensitivity to off and you're just using the rear display for live view. Conversely, if you're uh, remote controlling the camera and you don't want the rear screen or the EVF, then you can combine the two functions we just talked about and it will stop EVF, uh, sorry, uh, live view from appearing on either of them. Yeah, okay, covered that. And then a uh, final one, control wheel. So for those that have seen or own, lucky enough to own a 907, around the uh, shutter button, you have this small knurled control wheel. Now by default, that allows um, easy, easy uh, changing of the aperture setting. 
when you press the small uh, shift button here, this then converts to uh, a shutter speed adjustment. Obviously, you can see that on the rear screen. Uh, if you pop the screen up, uh, go to the control screen, you've got your aperture shutter and everything else there. But while you've got that folded down maybe, or you're in a shooting environment, this enables you to get very quick access to changing your shutter and aperture for your shooting start. Now, for some people that may not be enough, um, you need more control. And so for that, to be honest, we recommend the control grip accessory. Effectively, this replicates the two uh, knurled wheels that you might have got if it was an X1D. You've got a joystick here, which is great for moving AF point around, etc. And then you've got a series of additional control buttons and a secondary shutter button. So that gives you some more mechanical interface for those that would prefer that compared to using the touchscreen uh, on the control settings. There currently is no way of changing the default settings. So as I said, by default, without the shift button press, this is for aperture. I know we've been asked many times, well, can I swap that so that the default is shutter speed? And then I press the shift to aperture. Currently, that's not available within the firmware. Okay. I think that's pretty much it on the quick questions we had, Mark. Um, any more outstanding? Oh, you're working again. Yes, I've had to reboot my webcam for some reason, but I'm back, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, I've got a few questions, if you don't mind. Um, oh, I'm back, a quick yeah. question from uh, Luke, or Luck, I'm not sure how you pronounce that, I'm afraid, sorry. Um, but is it best to use the CFD2 with a 503 CXI or the 907X with a CF lens via the adapter? I suppose it's personal preference, isn't it? Yeah, that one is purely personal preference, what you're uh, used to. I mean, for me, if I had a V-series camera, um, the, the whole point of the, the CFV2 back is that it, it attaches to the camera and you don't have to think about it. Basically, it works like a film back. So you set the ISO, the white balance, and then just use the camera as you would have done if you had been shooting film. So, you know, if you've had that camera for a long time, you're going to be very comfortable quickly, you know, focusing the camera shooting, I probably would err uh, towards the um, using the V-System camera if I had one. Okay, um, a question from uh, Johannes. Um, the EVF, when you've got it to EVF only, does the EVF still turn off over time, like the power saving? Is there a way to stop that? Uh, yeah, I mean, you can stop it by changing the um, or lengthening the amount of time. But obviously, the longer the EVF's on when and you don't need to have it on, then the issue there is that uh, you're using battery for no reason because you've not got your eye to the camera. Um, but the whole point is the EVF uses less power than the rear display, shall we say. So that way, if you've gone to EVF only for live view, and you've got it set so that it only comes on when you lift it to your eye, you know, that's probably the best combination for maximizing the length of the battery, but also having quick access to the display. Okay. Um, quick question going back to the HTS from Ash. Um, yep. Do the focus assist um, tools like focus peaking, uh, does they, do they still work as normal? Yes, they do. So okay. focus peaking will work and also focus magnification. Um, and again, you know, these the combination of the lens, HTS, and adapter, and so on is quite weighty. So it's likely it's going to be on a on a tripod. Uh, so no issue there in terms of trying to support that. Uh, but yeah, basically, focus magnification will work, or, or focus peaking, whatever you want. Okay. Um, I asked a question from uh, Stefan previously. Um, I think we slightly misunderstood it, or um, okay. but anyway. It was regarding using a cable with the 500 ELX. Um, so would you need to use the ELX port or connector on the CFV2 digital back for that? Yeah, so if you want to control the uh, trigger, let me just scroll back. Sorry, Mark, I'll just scroll back to the page. Yeah, so here you can, you can connect from the ELX drive unit. 
the cable is supplied anyway and then you plug it in there uh, but that's basically for uh, again remote control it's not necessary for general shooting okay um Okay, we've got another one from Peter. Let me just scroll um, to find it. Um, he's got the issue when using the CFB 250C set to the 200 series camera on yep. his unmodified 205 FCC. Uh, yep. He often gets a black uh, unexposed frame if he touches the shutter button on the camera without even yep. starting to press it. Does he need to adjust something on the camera? Okay, so literally, he as he um, just presses the shutter, it should not trigger. Um, so, yeah, in that particular case, uh, what I can do is uh, have a test on it to see why he's getting the black frames. Uh, a quick test would be to change it to um, the 200 modified. So try the other 200 to see if that introduces enough of a delay, but it should not be triggering with just a, 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 a tap on, you know, a small press on the shutter. Um, but we, I can look into that. So we, we'll, we'll come back to him after the webinar on that one. Okay, great, thank you. Um, yeah, that's as many as I've got for at the moment. We've still got some questions coming in. Um, oh, okay. whilst, I just, um, whilst I just look through the, the questions, there's a couple of other um, suggested topics that we had uh, that we was gonna try and squeeze in if we had some time. Oh, okay, um, yeah. or not so much topics but mainly sort of quick fire questions um okay. one of them was regarding the 907x body sometimes getting a little bit warm or hot um yep. can we explain that a little bit yeah uh, i suppose the quickest way to explain that is that that's how it should be uh so the same as the x1d body uh so the inner frame of the camera bodies they're, they're aluminium and the whole point is that uh, because there's no uh, active cooling devices to, to, you know, like a Peltier system, whatever, to take the, the, the heat from the electronics and the sensor and so on out of the camera body, effectively, we use the, the, the metal of the camera body as a radiator. So it, it means everything's working properly. It will take the heat internal to the system and it uh, effectively warms the, the, you feel it on the outside of the case, you'll feel it's warm. Um, that's good. It means it's removing the heat from the inside of the camera and getting rid of it. Okay. And then also, um, we had the question whether you could shoot in different RAW formats on the X system cameras. Um, so currently, obviously, we have Hasselblad RAW. Uh, what yeah, are the reasons but, for that? Yeah. So be because obviously of our um, the way that we uh, put the raw files that we capture through Hasselblad's uh, natural color solution. So the, the way our color workflow and so on works, uh, we don't have any options within camera to have anything other than uh, basically Hasselblad raw file or a full-size JPEG if it's an X1D2 or a 907X. If you want a, a different type of raw, you've got to basically take the file into focus desktop software import it and then from there if you want to you can export as a dng and then open that in photoshop but that's the only additional raw options that we have so basically in camera it's hasselblad raw from focus desktop your only option really is is either hasselblad raw keep it like that or um, adobe dng okay um yeah, I think that's pretty much. I'm just looking through. Um, uh, but just to just to confirm that the HTS obviously only works with the H lenses because of the the H mount. Is that right? Correct. Correct. Yes. Okay. Um, and obviously the the obviously the 907 hex doesn't have an EVF. Um, so is it still possible to disable the live view on the screen no, there? No, because those options obviously on the 907 are not there. They physically don't exist here when you go into the menus. So this that particular one is just for X1D. Okay. 
Okay, and some just some quick fire questions. Where can I adjust exposure compensation on the 907X? And that's from Matthias. Is that possible? Yeah, so exposure compensation uh, is available on a control screen. So literally right in the middle, there's an exposure compensation graph. You can touch that and there's a slider which will enable you to uh, modify the exposure compensation. Obviously, if you've got the uh, grip, the control grip, and you're shooting in an in a aperture or shutter priority mode, the rear thumb wheel works as your exposure compensation. Okay. And then we've got a few questions, like there's one here, for example, from um, Jose. Um, wanting to use the CFB with um, like an Alpa body, so that's yep. all yep. possible as well. Yeah, so again, depends on the type of uh, shutter that's going to be in use. Uh, so if it's a mechanical copal style shutter, then it's, it's really straightforward in terms of a, a basically a triggering cable from the flash sync socket on the lens onto the flash in socket. Um, if you want to use it with uh, the uh, electronic shutters that are out there, uh, there are various uh, combinations of kit that you can use depending on the shutter unit. So a rod and stock and so on, um, which is like a USB connection and you'd be shooting um, effectively tethered. So you would have a USB from the camera to the computer running focus. You then have a control line going from the the computer to the USB control box. And that will be plugged into the digital back for triggering and into the um, uh, the electronic shutter in the in the lens unit. So that's possible as well. But obviously that's a, a, a fair degree of, of setup to get things sorted out there. Yep. Okay, um, I think that's pretty much it. There's a few more bits and pieces, but what we all think they're quite specific. And um, so I think we'll have a look at the questions after the webinar okay. and um, and look to get back to people individually. Um, so if we haven't answered your question uh, yet, sorry, but we will we'll try and come back to you afterwards. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so if I can just uh, finish off for today. So I'll just wrestle back the controls. Okay. Okay. Okay, so thanks, Chris. Um, as always, um, we would appreciate your feedback. So after the webinar, you should be presented with our feedback survey. If you're able to fill that in for us, that'd be much appreciated. It helps us to know what we're doing well and what you'd like us to do better. Um, so that's always good and much valuable to us. And then just a reminder that today's webinar has been recorded. So we'll be posting it to the Hasselblad YouTube channel shortly after the webinar or worst case uh, tomorrow morning. Um, and all the other webinars that we've done over the past sort of 18 months um, are on there as well. So if you've missed any, feel free to catch up on there. And then another quick reminder that the next webinar is an interview with Ben Thomas on the 11th of November. And the next Q&A webinar is a focus themed Q&A on the 24th of November. They're both available on the Hasselblad website. So if you go to the events page on there, there's the book and references. And as always, for any more information on Hasselblad, there's our Hasselblad website at Hasselblad.com, where we've got everything on there from future events and webinars, obviously lots on our products, our partner network around the world, lots of inspirational stories and images, um, lots on our history. And you can also use the website to request a demo and receive any support that you may need. So thanks once again for, uh, for joining us. I hope it's been useful for you and we look forward to seeing you again at another webinar soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.